Welcome back to another FLIP lecture. Today we're going to talk about how unresolved conflicts between the North and the South are going to lead to a civil war. And as far back as 1838, a lot of Americans felt that there was conflict perhaps in the horizon. And a young Abraham Lincoln, before he was president, gave a speech in which he said, From whence shall we expect the approach of danger? Shall some transatlantic giant step the earth and crush us at a blow? Never. All the armies of Europe and Asia could not by force take a drink from the Ohio River or set a track on the Blue Ridge in the trial of a thousand years. If destruction be our lot, we ourselves must be its author and finisher. As a nation of free men, we will live forever or die by suicide. And Lincoln's contention that the only thing that could destroy America was Americans themselves kind of goes along with this idea that there are many unresolved conflicts that we've already looked at. Unresolved conflicts between states and federal governments, the meaning of the union, and power sharing. Economic differences between North and South, slavery, and especially the two sections of the country, North and South, growing apart from each other and growing increasingly distrusting of one another. And so as we go through this story, there's going to be a few types of events that are going to push this conflict. First is going to be disagreement over laws, as we've looked at before. Western expansion is going to push the issue of the spread of slavery. And those wishing to preserve slavery versus those who wish to abolish it are likewise going to push this issue forward. And then finally, elections are going to be very contentious between the North and the South. And so we'll start with a few that you already know about. In 1820, remember, Missouri wanted to be joined the Union as a slave state, which led to the creation of Maine in order to try to keep the number of slave and free states together. Also, additionally, if you remember, the compromise line that would separate the northern free territory from the southern slave territory uh, was created in order to try to settle and resolve this conflict going forward. But ultimately, as we're going to see, the breakdown of the Missouri Compromise is going to be a major cause of the Civil War, as well as the debate over whether slavery should expand into the West. Also, too, in 1832, under President Andrew Jackson was the nullification crisis. And again, if we remember, the nullification crisis was over arguments about the tariffs that the South called the Tariff of Abominations. Well, this disagreement over the tariff ended up bringing up the issue of nullification and secession, and whether or not states had a right to, one, nullify laws that the federal government passed, and two, secede from the Union if they felt that the Union no longer represented their best interest. And so, as we looked at these issues in the past, similar ones are going to happen in this story. But really, kind of the major force that's going to drive a lot of the conflict is going to be America's Western expansion. Manifest Destiny, remember this attitude that God had ordained that the Americans should move west, is going to bring up a number of conflicts, especially whether that Western territory should be free or whether it should be slave. And so in terms of the slavery question, there's actually two parts to it. The first has to do with balance of power. If new states come in that are either free or slave, it's going to upset the balance of power, the number of free and slave states. And the second really contentious issue is that the question of should slavery be allowed to spread beyond where it is into those new western territories. And a lot of Americans are going to say no, but an equal number are going to fight for the spread of slavery west. And so this conflict comes into comes to a head in 1846 to 1848 with the Mexican-American War. And as we talked about, this war is going to result in major US territorial gains. And the debate over the new territory actually began with the annexation of Texas. Uh, the United States basically deciding to bring the Republic of Texas into the United States. But the question was, should the United States add a new slave state? And so Texas, very popular among Southerners, was actually seen as a plot by Northerners to spread slavery into the West. And as we can see from these maps, the United States before the Mexican-American War is going to look very different than the America that 
is going to um, be after the U.S. victory in the war. The Mexican cession includes a large number of Western territories, and the question is going to have to be asked, will those territories end up being free or slaveholding, and will the Compromise of 1820 hold up in 1848? And so at this point in our story, the United States, after also gaining the Oregon country, is going to finally fulfill the Manifest Destiny idea, where the United States territory is going to be from the Atlantic all the way to the Pacific Ocean. But the conflict over this new territory is brought to a head by questions of the Missouri Compromise. Almost 30 years after this compromise, would it hold up? And a lot of Northerners believe that the compromise is outdated and new ideas that slavery should be banned in the West are going to start to take uh, center stage. And so the, most of the land of the Mexican session is going to actually be south of the compromise line, excluding kind of some territories um, in California and what eventually becomes Nevada. But Congressman David Wilmot of Pennsylvania decided to propose a condition, also known as a proviso, in a bill that was going to provide money to pay for the war, but this condition said that slavery would be banned in the new territories. And so for the Southerners, they believed that the Compromise of 1820 had settled, had settled that debate, that the new territory in the South would end up being slave. And so David Wilmot's proviso, his attempt to ban slavery in the South, creates a huge outrage in the South and increases distrust in the North. And so ultimately the Senate, led by John C. Calhoun of the South, is going to stop it by voting it down. But the damage was already done, and the distrust between the two sides is going to grow after this attempt at the Mexican-American War to ban slavery in new territories. And so the debate over the proviso is very enlightening. David Wilmot essentially argued for free soil, that slavery should not expand westward, and that all of the new western territories should be owned by individual farmers and not by anyone who owns slaves. But John C. Calhoun in the South believed that actually new states were owned, sorry, the new territories were owned by the states in common. And so that the federal government had no right to ban slavery under the Constitution, that only an individual state could choose to ban slavery in its own territory. And the proviso is also seen as sneaky and aggressive, and this is going to feed Southern paranoia that Northerners are coming to take their slaves. And so John C. Calhoun, ever quotable, said that the day that the balance between the two sections of the country, the slaveholding states and the non-slaveholding states, is destroyed, is a day that will not be far removed from political revolution, anarchy, civil war, and widespread disaster. And so in the aftermath of the Mexican-American War, there is already talk that perhaps in the future, war may come. And so as Americans continue to move west beyond uh, this new territory, again, every new state that's going to be created is going to bring up the slave-free state issue. And so some politicians in America, not wanting to have um, the Compromise of 1820 fight every single time that a new state wanted to join the Union, propose a solution to the slavery issue something known as popular sovereignty, the rule of the people. And this idea said that the citizens of the individual territories should decide for themselves if they should be free or slave state. And the hope of this was to take the issue of slavery out of the national debate and allow each individual um, territory to vote on whether it would be slave or free. But this is going to cause some major problems in the future because think about voting. And we'll see if you can kind of come up with how this is going to cause problems in the future. So the next place where um, the slave-free debate is going to take place is going to be in the recently um, taken territories of California. And so California had been growing, especially the city of San Francisco. And so by 1850, the California gold rush in 1849 had created a massive population boom. And with that massive population boom came lawlessness. There's not much government in California. There is not uh, much police. And so because of this, California applies for statehood in 1850, desperate to set up a government that can rule all of these new people coming into the territory. So in 1850, California applies for statehood as a free state. And a little pop culture connection for you, the gold rush of 1849 is what the San Francisco 49ers are named for. 
But California wanting to enter the country as a free state is going to cause a major issue in terms of the balance of power between free and slave states. There are no other territories that are ready for statehood. There is only California, and they will upset the balance. And so what happens is that Southern fears, especially after the Wilmot Proviso, are going to lead some states to consider this early secession from the United States and declarations of independence for their individual states. And so the California problem is very, very real. And Southern fears are very real. And so one final compromise is going to have to be created. And so our leaders that we've talked about before, the aging leaders of the Republic, John C. Calhoun representing the South, Daniel Webster representing the North, and Henry Clay representing, the, representing compromise, kind of come together one last time to try to figure out a compromise to save the Union. And Henry Clay comes up with a final compromise between the North and the South. And his proposition said that California would become a free state. That popular sovereignty would be used to settle the slavery question in Utah and New Mexico. One of those territories is above the compromise line, one of them is below, and so the idea was that those two states would be fair. It also is going to ban the slave trade in Washington, D.C. Because remember, many northern um, politicians were offended by the prevalence of the slave trade in the capital, and so the South basically um, gives in to that demand in exchange for a Fugitive Slave Act that would be passed um, and would protect southern slaveholders um, and kind of lessen their fears that the North was coming to abolish slavery. And so essentially what everybody gets out of this out of this compromise is the assurance that their interests will be protected. The North gets California as a free state and the slave trade banned in Washington, D.C. The South gets protections for slavery in the form of a Fugitive Slave Act and further laws that um, kind of, I guess you would say, um, kind of shore up the slave trade being legal in the United States. And both sides compromise on popular sovereignty to decide slavery in Utah and New Mexico. And so ultimately this compromise looks to kind of solve the free slave question, but ultimately it's going to fail to resolve the bigger issue. And this compromise was actually not really very popular. It was very contentious, and a great debate was actually held in the United States Senate about the future of the country and this Fugitive Slave Act. And John C. Calhoun, for his part, though he participated in the compromise, gave a speech that said he did not think it would save the Union. He said that secession was the South's only honorable action that remained, and that northern treachery would never be stopped. Senator Daniel Webster, speaking on behalf of the North, called on the Senate to accept the compromise to avoid civil war. And Webster gave a speech in which he said, there can be no such thing as peace, peaceable secession. Peaceable secession is an utter impossibility. I see as plainly as I see the sun in the heaven that that disruption must produce. I see that it must produce war, and such a war as I will not and cannot describe. And so ultimately, the compromise is going to fail. Calhoun, Clay, and Webster are all going to die by 1852. But the ideas of the compromise carry on, and new leaders, led by Illinois Senator Stephen A. Douglas, are actually going to pass the individual pieces of the compromise piece by piece over the next few years. And so once this compromise goes into place, it eases, temp it eases the tensions, but only very temporarily. And as a part of this Compromise of 1850, the Fugitive Slave Act is going to go into effect. And this new law that is going to allow um, the southern slave hunters to go into northern territories and reclaim slaves is going to split the abolitionist movement in two, where the radical abolitionists are going to want an immediate end to slavery and they're going to actively resist and fight against the Fugitive Slave Act. Free soilers such as Abraham Lincoln and the new Republican Party are just going to want to stop the spread of slavery into new territories and urge the North to abide by the terms of the compromise. 
And so this Fugitive Slave Act itself, um, its purpose is to calm Southern fears and to protect slavery by allowing escaped slaves to be taken out of the North and returned to their owners. However, the downside of this is that not very much evidence was needed. Oftentimes, all slave hunters had to say was, this person is a slave, and that was enough evidence to basically take that person into custody, whether they were a free Northerner or not. It also forced federal marshals um, and Northern police to help catch escape slaves. But many Northerners started resisting the Fugitive Slave Act, sometimes very violently, sometimes attacking slave hunters in order to free captured slaves. And so tensions are going to rise as a result of this. South is outraged at the North's refusal to obey the law, and they believe that the Southern way of life itself is under attack by the Northerners. Um, adding fuel to the abolitionist movement and the anti-slave sentiment is actually going to be a novel published um, called Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. And this novel that's published in 1852 is the bestseller of its day. Um, it has such a large impact on public opinion that it's really considered a cause of the war. When Abraham Lincoln met Harriet Beecher Stowe, the author, he said, so you're the woman who started this big war. And it's a novel that really, the point of it is to depict the horrors of slavery and make an emotional and human argument that abolition is the only right thing to do. And after selling millions of copies, it's going to turn a lot of Northerners against the institution of slavery. Which brings us to the second act of our story, where all of these tensions end up exiting politics and culture and end up spilling over.